Hi everyone and welcome to our new message series which will be looking at the Apostles' Creed. This short statement of faith stands as a timeless distillation of Christian faith. It's a historic affirmation of the faith. It's what Christians believe. The Apostles' Creed collapses time and space and unites true believers in the one holy and apostolic faith. Bold claims. Now you might balk at the idea that there is any need for Christianity to have a creedal statement. Surely the Bible is enough. Perhaps you're uncomfortable with the idea that this is what all true Christians believe, or that this is what unites true believers together, as it sounds all a little too formulaic or even judgmental. So whatever position you currently hold, I would encourage you to join us over 12 weeks as we explore line by line this hugely significant Christian statement of belief, which for centuries long has stood alongside the Ten Commandments and the Lord's Prayer. We will unpack the rich meaning of the text to help understand why each section of it is included. Importantly, we'll apply it to our situation today as a framework for followers of Christ in the 21st century. As in the era when it was formulated, today there are similar challenges to and detractors from authentic Christian faith. That is why the Apostles' Creed is as important today as it was when it was first formulated. We now live in a world where many claims are made as to what is right and true. In recent years it has even been said that we live in a post-truth era where objective facts appear less influential than appeals to a emotion, particularly noticeable in the Brexit, Brexit and the US presidential debates. There is a tolerance for dishonest, inaccurate allegations and outright denial of facts. Half-truths and blatant lies become routine there is a blurring of reality and fiction. But we hunger for honesty and truth. If you buy a car, you want to know the truth about that car. If you're in a relationship, you want to know the truth. So my objective in this series is that through it, we will be better equipped to discern authentic Christian belief in an age of fake news and appealing counterfeits. Christianity is not belief in belief. It is belief in a propositional truth that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, the Saviour of sinners. We do not believe in the Jesus of our imagination, but in the Christ of Scripture. With the Apostles' Creed, we have at our disposal a succinct summary of what Christians believe, which is crucial to our spiritual formation, and by it we gain greater clarity as to who God is and why we worship him. An understanding of the Apostles' Creed reminds us of where we have come from and informs us of our Christian community, who it is that we belong to, and what is the basis for our Christian unity. So quite an ambitious uh, set of objectives. So let's begin by simply reading the text of the Apostles' Creed. Because in the words of respected theologian Albert Moeller, all Christians believe more than is contained in the Apostles' Creed but none can believe less. It reads, and as I do, I'd encourage you to speak it out too, wherever you are. It reads, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead, on the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Although the exact origin of the Apostles' Creed is shrouded in mystery, and was not written by the Apostles, it does reflect the early church's effort to express and summarise the faith given by Christ to the Apostles. Sometimes referred to as the rule of faith, early Christians turned to it as they worshipped and taught the faithful. An abbreviated version of the Creed can be traced back to the second century where it seems to have been used first as a confession at one's baptism. By the fifth century, the Apostles' Creed had developed into the form as it is now used today. 
the Apostles' Creed, like all creeds during the patristic era, that is the period of the Church Fathers, was composed as a direct response to heresy in defence of the gospel and the Christian faith. It was intended to be apologetic in nature, that is, to articulate the essentials of Christian faith against a backdrop of error and false claims. Now, the immediate heresy that the creed responded to then was Gnosticism, which denied such things as the divine creation or the incarnation of Christ or the deity of Christ and, and, and salvation by faith in Christ alone, all doctrines that are expressly affirmed in the creed. The early church writers frequently cited articles of the Apostles' Creed in their own apologetic work, and ever since the Apostles' Creed has been affirmed in Reformed traditions and taught as a summary of the Christian faith's cardinal doctrines. But what are we to do with it, this ancient text? There is a big clue in that each verse of the Apostles' Creed begins with the Latin word credo, I believe. It is clear that there is an important connection between belief and faith and the Christian life. Creeds do not hold any authority in and of themselves, but rather they point outside of themselves to the ultimate authority of the Word of God. Now, I really like American pastor Mark, Matt Chandler's illustration here. The moon is awe-inspiring to look at, but it has no light of its own, yet it tells me that there's a light out there. Just saying these words won't make you a Christian. A creed is not some form of magic incantation. Just knowing these words has pretty limited value, but... If we look at the letter to the Romans, chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, we discover uh, something really important about how we are to view a creed. Let me read. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Verse 10, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. There are two things here. First, we have a confession that Jesus is Lord, that is to say, uh, with your mouth, that Jesus is the Lord of my life and that I want to live my life according to his ways. And then, second, there is belief, which must lead to action. The two must go together. That's why the idea of being a nominal Christian really makes no sense, that somehow that you say something with your mouth, but there's no accompanying belief. Let's look again at verse 10. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. If we look carefully at the Bible, we see it doesn't say no, it says believe. It doesn't say I know Jesus is Lord, it says I believe Jesus is Lord. Why is that important? It's important because belief leads to action and knowing may or may not. So we are to believe in our hearts that Jesus is Lord. It is a belief that leads to our justification, our right standing before God and our salvation. It is through belief and confession, not just knowledge, that by God's grace and in the Spirit's power that we experience the life-giving power that comes through an understanding of the creed as it points us to the Word of God. So for the remainder of this opening talk, I would like to offer four reasons why the Apostles' Creed is useful and necessary in the life of the church as it gathers together in worship. So first, the Apostles' Creed defines truth. As we've already mentioned, the Apostles' Creed, like all creeds during the patristic era, was composed as a direct response to heresy. Heresy being the denial of a, a doctrine that is, is central to Christianity. So that it could be used in defense of the gospel and the Christian faith, it is apologetic in nature, meaning that it articulates the essentials of the Christian faith against a backdrop of error and false claims. The corollary then of having uh, of defining truth is that a creed refutes error. Although the heresies that we encounter today may well be different to those of previous eras, error always exists. And so the church and believers in every generation need to be alert to these so that they can hold to orthodox biblical theology. This current generation, perhaps for the first time, almost objects to the very existence of truth. History, however, teaches that heresy and false teaching 
pose horrible dangers to the people of God and the health of the church. Second, the Apostles' Creed summarises the faith. The Apostles' Creed is sometimes referred to as the Twelve Articles of Faith because it expresses essential biblical doctrines. Its role is not to replace scripture, rather to summarise its content into succinct statements. For this reason, and from its earliest usage, the Creed was used as an aid to spiritual formation and in the preparation of new believers for baptism. New believers in the early church were asked to affirm line by line the Apostles' Creed as their confession of the true Christian faith. As such, this summarising of the faith functions as a guardrail for the church's teaching and instruction and offers a framework for healthy theological discussion and development. It is in this sense that the creed brings balance to our faith. Again, Matt Chandler employs this uh, following helpful image of physical training, comparing it to the role of the creed. For any who have worked out regularly at a gym, there's always some guy who's shaped like an upside down pear with, with kind of toothpicks for legs. Now he's clearly developed some sections of his body at the expense of others. It's a powerful reminder that it can be exactly the same when it comes to our own spiritual development. We can get all out of balance in our Christian life. We might like some bits about faith, but not others. Perhaps we're all over the stuff about how Jesus forgives sin, but tend to think less about that one day he's going to return again to judge the living and the dead. Creeds help us stay in good spiritual balance. Third, the Apostles' Creed brings clarity. As we develop a fuller understanding of the creeds, we gain greater clarity about who God is and his true nature. And as such, it instructs the church and us on the nature of proper worship. It's because the Apostles' Creed gives expression to the most glorious and majestic truths of the Christian faith, we're beckoned into heartfelt praise and worship of God. And as we do this with others in corporate worship, the I believe becomes we believe, together with Christians across space and time. Creeds offer a useful corrective to current trends and fashions. A recent study of Christian evangelical belief in the United States revealed some disturbing facts. For example, when it came to the doctrine of God, large sections deny that Jesus is God in the flesh. They deny the deity of Christ. They deny that the Holy Spirit is a person. Many simply think that he's some sort of ethereal presence and not a person. Further, the survey revealed that less than half of evangelical Americans think that the Bible is the word of God, or that it is true, and so it's hardly surprising that many reject what the Bible has to say on ethical issues. Now, I, I doubt whether the situation in the UK is that different. It was A.W. Tozer who said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Getting our thinking about God straight will help straighten out our life. Fourth and finally, the Apostles' Creed shapes our Christian community. Within the Creed, we see the faithful witness of those who have faithfully finished the race, and so through it, we're connected to the faith of those who have gone before us and drawn together with other Christians in a genuine bond of unity. I think we are prone to undervalue this hugely important aspect of the value of, of the Creed, all the more as over the last couple of years, we've witnessed the rampant individualism within society being further exaggerated of which the church has not been immune, leading to an increasingly common mindset that it's fine just to worship alone. We don't realise just how big this thing is, this Christian faith of ours, that we're all caught up in. We're part of a people that's been around for thousands of years, going back to the beginning of humankind when God called people to himself. Now we're a part of that. We're a historic people. More than that, we're a global people. People all over the earth will this Sunday gather because they believe this and they'll rejoice in it. They'll be shaped and formed by it and huge numbers will recite it together. We're woven into something so much bigger than us, a fabric created by God that makes us stronger than we will ever be on our own. It's a beautiful thing. We're part of it. It isn't new. It's just that it's our turn to run this section of the faithful race. Belief is a powerful thing. Belief is a very powerful thing. As we read the creed earlier, 
we were doing uh, as our brothers and sisters have done around the world for close on two millennia. Now, it's worth remembering, when the early church recited the Apostles' Creed, it was simultaneously their greatest act of rebellion and their greatest act of allegiance. When they gathered, they didn't have the comfort of the law of the land protecting them. They didn't know who might be watching them or listening as they recited these words. But what they did know was that they were rejecting the popular narratives of their day. So in Rome, they rejected Caesar was Lord. And instead, they were proclaiming their belief in Jesus as Lord. At the same time, they were rejecting the narrative of their day and placing their allegiance in the God of the Bible. And then, oh sorry, as then, it's a beautiful moment that whenever the people of God recite this creed and affirm, we don't believe the false narratives that culture is telling us. Instead, we have a better story to tell. Today, when we affirm this creed, we're aligning ourselves with the God of the scriptures, with historic Orthodox Christian faith. And by faith, we believe that we will encounter God in new and powerful ways, that our lives will be transformed more into the likeness of Christ, and that we'll experience a depth of Christian community that is the envy of those around us. What an exciting prospect then for the remainder of our time together. Let's pray that in the coming weeks, that by the grace of God and empowered by the Holy Spirit, we might be rooted more deeply in this, our glorious Christian faith. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have had just a short time this uh, day to reflect on and begin to unpack the significance of the Apostles' Creed. Heavenly Father, my prayer is simple that in the days and weeks to come, as we get to have a greater understanding of the significance of this, we might see who you are more clearly. We might understand more fully what it means to hold to the truth. Father, we might understand the importance of balance in our spiritual development. We might understand how that we are connected into community and that we're part of this huge story. So, Father, will you expand our hearts and our minds, we pray. And we do ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.